I'm going to use an example to explain the Viterbi algorithm. And I'm going to choose an equalization example, but it holds equally well for decoding of convolutional codes. But here's an equation for the output of a channel when there's inter-symbol interference. And in this case, we've got the direct path when n equals zero, and then L taps of inter-symbol interference. And for more information about inter-symbol interference, uh, check out the description below this video. Here, I represents the digital data, either noughts or ones. The channel taps are given by F, and this W is Gaussian noise, white Gaussian noise. And we're going to define this uh, vector here of data symbols for the inter-symbol interference. So this is at uh, IK plus L, capital L is the number of taps of inter-symbol interference, and we're given by this vector here. So let's, let's think about the Viterbi algorithm. An important component of the Viterbi algorithm is something called a branch metric. We're going to see more about this in just a second. But this branch metric at time k is defined as the negative of the natural logarithm of the PDF of the output measurements, these measurements here, given the input data. And because it's Gaussian noise, uh, in this particular case, that's proportional to uh, this uh, squared term here, which is the measurements minus what you would get, what you expect to get for a certain combination of input data. So you can test this. This is why it's called a branch metric. So you can measure the measurements output of the channel, and then you can uh, take the difference between what you actually measure and what you would have measured if there had been that input sequence. And then you can try all the different combinations of input sequence. So let's look at one example here, and this is the one we'll do uh, with a trellis uh, for L equals two. So there's a direct path, and then there's also uh, two intersymbol interference components. This term here can be written as uh, YK plus two uh, with the three terms, one from the direct path at the time K plus two, and then another two from intersymbol interference. And you might be asking, why is this time K for the branch metric but the measurement is time k plus 2. And that's a very important aspect of the Viterbi. And the reason is, is that when you have intersymbol interference, each input data affects multiple outputs. That's another way of viewing and thinking about this equation here. So in the case of L equals 2, for example, uh, a data that uh, goes into the channel at time k will not only affect the measurement at time k, but it will also be affecting the measurements at time k plus 1 and k plus 2. And that's very important. So we can't just simply measure a measurement at time k and make a decision on what we thought the input data would be at that time k. Because we need really to take the measurements of k plus 1 and k plus 2 into account when we're thinking about the data of k, because it's going to affect those measurements as well. And in fact, of course, k plus 1, the input at time k plus 1 affects three measurements at time k plus 1, k plus 2, and k plus 3, and so on. So in fact, when you have intersymbol interference, to do an optimal detector, you would need to consider the entire block length and do an exhaustive search over all the combinations of all of the possibilities of the input data stream for the entire block length. And the Viterbi algorithm is a clever way of doing that exhaustive search, but doing it in a, an efficient way which prunes out some of the combinations as you go. And that's what we're going to see when we look at the Viterbi algorithm. So let's look at the actual Viterbi algorithm equation. So here we have the Viterbi algorithm equation. And we can see this term here is the branch metric. Now we're going to be adding it to something called a path metric. So let's look at a trellis and understand what this path metric is and how it relates to the branch metrics. So here we have a trellis for this example when L equals two. And for more information on trellises, uh, check out the description below this video. Here we can see we have uh, an example of K equals six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. I've just chosen those time periods to take an example. And we've got four states in our trellis at each time period. So each time period here has four states. And the states are given by 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And what you can see is there are eight different branches between 
each of the time periods, between the states of each of the time periods. And this corresponds to the eight combinations of the three data symbols, the ones and zeros, that are possible because we are looking at the case when L equals two. So there's the direct path plus two intersymbol interference paths. There's three, two to the power of three equals eight. So there's eight branches in our trellis. Now let's be a bit more precise about it. What do this zero zero mean uh, for this? Well, if the path matrix at time K, so here, for example, if we take K equals six, then it's a function of the data here uh, for K I, capital I, K plus L. And this was uh, going to be given by uh, I uh, K plus one and I K plus two. And that's the case for uh, this case when capital L equals two. So the left, the, the right hand data, which is a, a mapping of these states, the right hand one will correspond to K plus one. The left hand one will correspond to K plus two. So let's write that out in example here when K equals six, that means the right hand one is going to be telling us about I7 and the left hand one is going to be telling us about I8. And similarly for here, when K equals seven, uh, the left hand one is going to be telling us about I9 and the right hand one is going to be telling us about I8 and so on. So now it's important to realize that this trellis maps out all the different paths that are possible from all the different data sequences. So each path through this trellis tells us a specific combination of the input data. So for example, this branch across here, it has the same value of I8. Uh, so the left-hand side here is zero because that tells us I8 has to be zero. And the right-hand side is zero because this one tells us that I8 is zero. So that branch there corresponds to I8 equaling zero, when I7 equals zero and I9 also equals zero. So each of these branches contributes to a path and the challenge of the Viterbi algorithm is to find the optimal path through this trellis that matches up with the measurements that are taken. And so we're gonna use those measurements to work out all the branch metrics and then we have to use all those branch metrics to update all the path metrics and find paths through this trellis. So let's see how we do that with an example. So let's think about K plus seven and the first state. So we're looking for the path metric at seven for this time when this uh, vector here equals zero, zero. And for that, we're going to have to look at the measurement at time nine, because that's seven plus two. So this is Y9, and this is because, as we said before, the input data at time seven affects outputs up to time nine. So we need to be looking at time nine. Okay, so we're going to take our measurement at time nine and work out the branch metric for this branch along here when the combination here is zero, zero, zero. And so let's say, for example, that we did that calculation, and let's say that that was a metric of one. And let's say we did uh, this, the same thing for this branch here, where there's a, a different combination of the input data. And let's say that this gave us a branch metric of four. So now what we need to do is we now need to add those for each of those two branches. We're gonna add them to the path metric that got you to the left-hand state. So let's say, for example, we've, we're just check, looking at K equals six, and let's say already we've made a whole lot of calculations for the trellis that leads up to this. I haven't shown it here, but let's say I did that. And let's say those path metrics, each of these states has a path metric of the path that gets there. And let's say, for example, those path metrics were 15 for that state. For example, let's say the path metric was 13 for this state. Uh, let's say it was 12 for this state. And let's say it was 14 for this state. So let's say we had already calculated those path metrics for each of these states. So what does the Viterbi algorithm do? Well, the Viterbi algorithm, it goes, it looks, it takes the branch metric and adds it to the path metric, and then does it for all of the different branches which are gonna come into this state. And then it looks to, for the one which has the minimum metric. Okay, so let's do that here. So for this branch here, it has a branch metric of one and a path metric of 15. 
So 15 plus 1 is 16. For this one here, it has a branch metric of 4 and a path metric of 13, and that gives 17. So we want the minimum out of those two. So 16 is the minimum out of those two. So what we can do then is we put a, uh, a value here for the new path metric at this time at k equals 7. This path metric is now going to be 16. And we can determine that this branch here is not a successful branch. And we are going to put in this line here. And so what we're saying there is we're using this minimization here. We're picking the branch which gave us the smallest value of this branch plus path. Okay, so 1 plus 15 was less than 4 plus 13. We're going to select that one and not select this one. And this is how we start to see that the Viterbi algorithm is pruning out possibilities from the overall exhaustive search and, in, and meaning that we don't need to check any of the sequences through this entire trellis that go along this branch. The Viterbi algorithm tells us there's a preferable branch. It's this one. So we don't need to check these anymore. So let's do the same. Then, then we do this for each of the states at the same time. So at time k equals 7 in this case. So let's look at it here. And let's say, for example, we had worked out that this branch metric here was 1, for example. And let's say that this branch metric here was 4 for example. And so at this state here, we are looking at 1 plus 12, which is less than 4 plus 14. So we will keep this branch and we will uh, update and add our now new path metric here, which is this value here, which is the addition of the branch plus the previous path. So that will be 13. So we're now going to put 13 there. And now we do the same for all the other states at this same time. So I'm just going to uh, write in some example branch metrics here and then write in the new path metrics. So now we can see that there are four surviving paths at time k equals seven. And interestingly, we can see that some of the surviving paths have higher branch metrics than the one that they were competing against. So even though the branch metric for this combination of 0, 0, 1, uh, even though this combination had a low branch metric, the previous path metric that got it to there was higher. So the combination of 16 was higher than this combination of 15. So it, it shows us that we can't just look at one time period and make a decision on what the input data was. If we'd done that, we would have chosen this branch here. But we need to have the branch metric plus the previous path metric. That's the important thing that we're seeing here. So now we're going to continue that at the next time. We're just going to repeat the process. We're going to do it for each of the states. So let me fill in examples of the uh, branch metrics for all of the rest of this trellis. And then I will start to fill in the surviving branches. Okay, so now let's look at this first state at time k equals 8. We have 16 for the path metric, 3 for the branch metric. That gives us 19. And along the competing one, which we have to find the minimum of, is 13 plus 2 is 15. And so this is a lower value. So we've got 15 here. And we're going to keep, in this case, keep this branch here. OK. And now we continue on, of course, and do all the others at this time. And now we can see something interesting. So at time k equals 8, we can look back and we can see that nothing survived from this state here. And likewise, nothing survived from this state here. So now we know, we can tell, that it must have been that it was either one of these two states. So we're starting to narrow down the choices of the input data at previous times because some of these paths don't survive. So it's not only that branches don't survive, but now some of the paths don't survive. And you can see that here. OK, so now let's uh, continue on and fill out the rest. So now I've filled in all the paths along the branches that survive in this example or the time slots that we've shown. And now we can see something very interesting. So if we look here, all of the paths here we can see originated through this state here. So what we can now see is that what we call a convergence of paths as we look backwards. 
So all of these paths have gone through this state here. So now what we can see is that it must be that our best estimate is going to be that I9 and I8 have to be one and zero. And likewise, we can look back along that path and know that this is the only state that exists at time k equals six. So therefore, I7 must have been one and so on as we look back along that surviving path. So this path will be the only path that's, that goes from this time to this time. It's the only path that actually makes it up to time k equals 10. And so this is how the Viterbi algorithm is even more efficient. Not only is it doing a, an efficient way of doing an exhaustive search by chucking out branches and not looking at some of the branches, but also it means you can do it in real time with a fixed or with a delay, a certain delay. Sometimes you can uh, pick to a fixed delay, sometimes variable. But what we mean by delay is we're processing up at time k equals 10, uh, but we can now start actually making decisions about which data we are going to have as our estimates at a delay backwards in the trellis where these paths merge. So if you can find a point where the paths merge, then you can declare that to be the winner. This path here, for example, up to 18, this one came from uh, up here, which didn't go through this path. Uh, so if we were looking at this time, we couldn't see a merging of paths because these three paths all go through this node, but this uh, path here does not go through that node. And in fact, doesn't even go through the node at k equals six or whatever. So at k equals nine, we don't have the case of the paths merging at least within what we've shown in this example, but at time k equals 10, we do see a merging of paths. And so therefore you can start to make decisions even before you get to the end of the entire data sequence, which is one of the real advantages of the Viterbi algorithm. So if this video has helped you to understand the Viterbi algorithm, please give it a thumbs up, it helps others to find the video. Check out the description below where there's a web page with a fully categorized listing of all the videos on the channel. And of course, subscribe to the channel for more videos.